the Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to rise and add my voice to the debate on the fall economic statement. Uh, this bill is a, a disappointing but unsurprising continuation of the high tax, high inflation policy that we have come to expect from this Liberal government. This bill offers Canadians more debt, more taxes, more spending, and the prospect of more inflation and higher interest rates in the months and years ahead. I say that Canadians have come to expect this kind of bill because this is consistent with what these Liberals have delivered for the last seven years. Back in 2015, these Liberals promised three years of what they called modest deficits that would be incurred entirely for the purpose of a transformational infrastructure construction program that would lead to the budget balancing itself by 2019. Well, Mr. S Madam Speaker, it was obviously obvious right from the start that this solemn election promise was a lie told to the Canadian voters. They immediately started piling on new spending without any fiscal restraint and drove Canada straight into deficit, and they have never talked about a balanced budget since. It was as if no Liberal MP had ever heard the promise that they made to millions of Canadians on doorsteps, that if Liberals were elected, they would get short, modest deficits offset by gleaming new productivity-improving infrastructure, but instead we have structural deficits and industries struggling under the weight of ever-increasing regulation. I remind members of this House and Canadians watching or, or reading this because this government's track record is how its credibility should be measured. So after ignoring its promise by pretending that they never made it, Bill Morneau assured Canadians that what really mattered was not deficits, but that the debt-to-GDP ratio would constantly shrink. Then when his own department's projections looked like this so-called fiscal anchor was in jeopardy, he suddenly said, no, 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 what really matters was Canada's AAA debt uh, credit rating. And then when one agency downgraded Canada's credit rating, and when Canada was paralyzed by rail blockades, when Canada's lack of pipeline capacity was helping drive Canadian energy prices below zero, when the economy was teetering on the brink of recession, and when this government was about to table a massive deficit budget, COVID struck. Madam Speaker, it's critical for Canadians to remember this important point. This government squandered four years of a booming world economy by creating new taxes and regulations that decimated Canadian industries and racked up $100 billion in new debt before the pandemic. All of this happened before the pandemic, Madam Speaker. Conservatives warned this government throughout the first four years that it was grossly irresponsible to run large deficits and fail to build promised infrastructure while times were relatively good. Conservatives repeatedly warned the government that they were leaving Canadians vulnerable by leaving the cupboard bare during good times. Well, Madam Speaker, the Conservative leader certainly didn't predict the COVID pandemic, but he did warn the government that it had a responsibility to act prudently in order to maximize Canada's capability to manage an economic downturn. So now, nearly three years later, according to this fall economic statement, Canada's debt is nearly $1.2 trillion, more than half of which was piled on by this government alone. And the majority of the new debt that this government has added had nothing to do with COVID response measures. $100 billion of it came before COVID. $205 billion was added to the debt after the pandemic for spending that had nothing to do with the pandemic. While the current and previous finance ministers were running these huge deficits, they assured Canadians that this was all okay. They said interest rates are low. They said interest rates would remain low for the foreseeable future. They even said that rates were so low that they could run a deficit while lowering the debt to GDP ratio. So while the finance ministers were racking up the debt, the Bank of Canada was cranking up the printing press. The Department of Finance issued new debt, and the Bank of Canada bought it with cash created out of thin air. Current and previous governors of the Bank of Canada assured Canadians that this was fine and that there was nothing to be concerned about. In fact, I asked the governor of the Bank of Canada if buying up all this debt with newly conjured money would eventually trigger inflation, and he said no. He dismissed the concerns that I raised two and a half years ago about inflation. He said that there would be no inflation and that even if there was, they had plenty of tools to deal with that. Our Conservative leader also raised these concerns consistently over the past two and a half years. 
Well, the finance minister dismissed these conservative concerns about inflation and said that any inflation was simply transitory and nothing to worry about. Well, now, here we are, Madam Speaker. We're in a full-blown cost-of-living crisis where Canadians are increasingly unable to afford basic necessities of life like food, like groceries, gasoline, uh, housing, home heating. Inflation has been called, Madam Speaker, the cruelest tax of all. It destroys the life savings of seniors. It destroys the purchasing power of workers whose wages don't keep up with the cost of the goods that they need to live. Canada now has the highest inflation in 40 years, and yet there is absolutely nothing in this fall economic statement that will meaningfully address this crisis. Milton Friedman said, quote, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon in the sense that it can be produced only by a more rapid increase of the quantity of money than in output, unquote. Or as the Conservative leader has put it, there is too much money chasing too few goods. The cost of government is driving up the cost of living. We need to stop printing cash and start producing more of the things that cash buys, like food, houses, and affordable energy. So now that inflation is out of control and wreaking havoc on Canadians' ability to feed, house, heat, and transport themselves, the Bank of Canada is raising interest rates faster than at any point in decades. This has two important consequences for Canadians. First, it means that thousands, perhaps even millions of Canadians, are going to see their monthly mortgage payments shoot up drastically in the months and years to come. And secondly, it means that the interest on Canada's debts will soon approach $50 billion per year, according to this fall economic statement. Canadians will soon spend more on interest, the Canadian government will spend more on interest than it does on health transfers or on national defence. And on top of all that, Madam Speaker, this bill offers no meaningful tax relief for Canadians. The government is proceeding to triple the carbon tax on home heating, gasoline and groceries. Again, breaking a previous election promise where they promised that they would not raise the carbon tax above $50 per megaton. So this is in addition to the payroll tax that's set to increase in just a few weeks. Madam Speaker, Canadians can't pay a higher carbon tax with a smaller paycheck. They can't afford higher food prices and higher home heating costs and higher gasoline and transportation costs. As the interest rates rise and house prices remain out of reach, Canadians despair that an entire generation gives up on the dream of home ownership. But Madam Speaker, the problems with this government go way beyond this terrible bill and deeply flawed and disappointing fall economic statement. This is a government that has failed Canadians so thoroughly that it's almost incomprehensible. The government is so hopelessly incompetent that Canadians can't get a passport they can't ensure access to basic children's medication. There are nearly two and a half million people waiting for an immigration decision. 10,000 people were ordered into quarantine and threatened by a useless and dubiously acquired phone application. Its payroll systems can't pay. Its procurement systems can't procure. Our Arctic is inadequately defended. Public officials have denied and defied democratic orders of parliament. Emergency powers have been declared under false pretense. Cabinet ministers interfere with police investigations. Basic information is routinely denied to members of the public and to journalists. Our energy resources remain in the ground while Europe freezes and Putin laughs. Canadians can't afford food. They can't heat their homes, and the finance minister continues to recklessly jeopardize Canada's future with uh, reckless spending and punishing taxes while mocking desperate, suffering Canadians by having them believe that she shares their hardships and can relate to them because she cancelled her Disney Plus subscription. I have no confidence in this government. I oppose this bill, and I oppose this government. It's time for a Conservative government and hope for Canadians. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member St. John Rossi. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member and my friend opposite for his impassioned speech. And, you know, I have to admit, Madam Speaker, for a while there I was feeling kind of bad, but then I remembered. 
The party opposite lives in this alternative reality that they are the fiscal managers, the fiscal stewards of this country. And let's not, let me remind Canadians, Madam Speaker, this is a party that ran nine straight deficits. They drove the Canadian economy into the ground. They tried to balance a budget in their 10th year by throwing in a sale of GE stocks and the rainy day EI fund and whatever to try to balance it. But the economy was a mess, Madam Speaker. And when challenged on that, they said, oh, we had hard times. They forget that we've just been through a worldwide pandemic. So my question to the member opposite, would he not agree that he doesn't have a leg to stand on with respect to fiscal stewardship? Thank you. <laughs> Our member of Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Well, it, it pains me to so thoroughly disagree with my friend from St. John Rothsies, and I, I thank him for putting on a tie and participating in the, uh, the debate today, but uh, he's completely wrong. The, the, cri the financial crisis that existed when the Conservatives were in office was then the great financial crash since the Great Depression. The Canada came out of that uh, firing on all cylinders, the strongest econo economy in the G7. They didn't resort to quantitative easing and printing funny money yes. like so many other countries did and like this government is now. So we will take no lessons from this government on financial management. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for St. C.S. St. Bagog. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like us to uh, give a shout out to uh, the uh, member. He, he's uh, he only said triple once instead of three times, so that's good for all of our mental health. So I'd like to thank him very, very warmly. And uh, so yes, I said it three times as well. Now, on to the question. Very simple questions, actually. So. It should just be a yes or a no answer. I think our colleagues are just as irritated as us when we don't get uh, responses from the government. So first question, what do we do with the governor of the central bank? Second question, what do we do with cryptocurrency? The honorable member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Well, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry that I didn't uh, <laughs> catch maybe a third question there or, or uh, get all of that and uh, you know, just talk about tripling tripling, tripling the carbon tax, but uh, uh, with respect to the Governor General, I mean, this, this uh, I, I would hope that all Canadians would expect the Governor of the Bank of Canada to uh, return to their core mandate of limiting inflation to 2% and not devalue uh, Canadian, Canadian currency. Um, the, uh, you know, we are very frustrated. I share his frustrations with the, the lack of responses and answers that we, uh, that we don't get from, uh, from this government. Questions and comments. The Honourable for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, um, you know, I'm thinking again about the resource extraction in our country and the lack of value add to some of that extraction that happened. So my question to the member is, is that would, do they support that there needs to be protections around Indigenous communities, uh, of course, Indigenous women and girls, as we look at expansion of resource extraction in Canada? The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. I think that resource extraction offer some of the best opportunities for remote Indigenous communities to improve, to, for to have access to uh, to jobs and the and the core services that that uh, that uh, the the revenue from these projects produce. And I, I think we've heard that uh, earlier in, in the in the leader speech. I think that. Uh, uh, it's very important for Indigenous communities and indeed all northern and remote communities that, that resource ex extraction can happen in Canada. Canada has a role to play in the world. Right now, Europe ris risks freezing this winter and fueling Putin's war for our inability to get energy resources to Europe where they're needed. It's a shame. And this government has tremendous responsibility uh, for this failure uh, of global energy security. It's just